We have had an awesome day. Jessica kind of kicked it off strong with maybe the best talk you guys will ever hear about uh, psychological safety. I'm gonna be honest with you. If I'd known I was coming on after an Olympic soccer player, I would have picked a different prop. <laughs> it's, aw it's awesome to be here in Clemson today. I grew up here, then it was a one stop light town. We measured our backyard by how far we could ride our, ride our bikes in the day and get back in time for dinner. I'm here to talk to you about play, empathy, and time machines. It's a lot easier to show than tell with play, which is why I have the soccer ball. I learned to play soccer at a camp at the YMCA over there a couple miles away on Lake Hardwell. And I wasn't fast, I'm obviously not built for speed, more of a hiker, but I did love playing goalie. And even though I don't practice these anymore, it's amazing what happens when you play and you build in muscle memory. The one thing I could do that the fast guys couldn't do is this right here. I would beat them every time. I'm already proud of myself. I didn't fall down. Now, as kids, we know we can play. We don't care about making mistakes. I learned a lot about this. I driven in off the Oregon coast down through Northern California, came across the Golden Gate Bridge from the north side. This is my daughter Lucy, at that time she was three years old. And I made this statement, sometime when you are older, we'll come back and you can ride your bike across the bridge. That night, she decided today's the day. So on a beautiful night with the sun going down over the Pacific, <laughs> the moon coming up over San Francisco, she set out for that 1.7 miles. Socks on her hand to keep her hands warm. Occasionally she would turn around the tricycle, look at me and say, oh, Dad, I'm tired, I wanna go back. I said, okay, I'm excited. And then she would laugh, she was playing with me, turn her tricycle back around and keep going. She went that 1.7 miles across and she came the 1.7 miles back. And that night, on the Golden Gate Bridge, I had this mantra that has stayed with me. I have one job, keep the twinkle in that little girl's eye. Thank you guys, this has been a lot of fun. Just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> I have a couple more thoughts about play and empathy, but we could almost stop there. Another thing I've learned about play is that it's gonna require messes. I had a project manager, Skip Steele, who'd invited us to his farm in Lincoln, North Carolina, which was near the nuclear plant where I was working. And as we toured the farm in the house, his wife pulled me aside and she'd noticed Lucy, who at that time was eight, and her creativity and said, hey, Charlie, if she's gonna be creative, if she's gonna be an artist, you're gonna be, have to be okay with her having messes. She's gonna need materials and she's gonna need space to do her own thing in her own way. Not long after that, we moved into a new house. In that house, Lucy has an imagination room. To this day, I have not made a comment about the content or the condition of anything in that room. Now, for a living, I help teams with very difficult projects. And I think what I identified on keeping the twinkle in Lucy's eye is also a great goal for these projects. And I wish I could take you to the middle of one of these projects, to the adrenaline rush, to the challenges, to the stress. I can't, but I can show you a little bit of what it looks like. There we go. We're at the US National Whitewater Center and we're rafting. We've been through something called a trip talk, which explains what we're gonna do on the rapids, how we're gonna react. We've also practiced in calm water something called high siding. In high siding, you wanna go usually downstream, all your weight almost out of the boat because the water has caught the upstream side of the boat is trying to flip you. So the guide's in the back of the boat, I'm next to him, he's screaming high side. Unfortunately, we have five tourists in the boat with us. They didn't listen to the trip talk. So although the guide and I are fighting as hard as we can to pull this thing out, the force of the water, like the force of the project, 
is eventually going to win and we're going swimming. Now, in rafting, this is a lot of fun. But I'm going to tell you this. It's a lot more fun when you go with seven people that know what they're doing and you fight that surf and you win and you come out the other side with a twinkle in your eye and you high paddle and you carry on down the river. Play with empathy with a team you love creates a culture. Now, I learned this, and usually I draw this for you, but it's a bigger room. So, uh, work with a guy named DJ. This is DJ. We're one year away from the project start. It's a fairly simple project. We're going to take something out, put something new in, connect it, and turn it on. Something happens to be a million pound stator that powers you know, two to two and a half million homes, but it's a simple three step project. And what happens here, and this diagram kind of shows it, is there's multiple levels of detail in this project. And on this day, I'm meeting with DJ again a year before the project starts, and there's one item that only DJ knows in the room. And I started to develop a theory here because what would happen is I'd work with these teams about two weeks before the project started, I'd start getting information that up till now I'd never heard. Guys, where have you been? Why don't we have this information? Those of you who are students know exactly what I'm talking about. You start the semester, you have a term paper. Do you think about it until about two weeks out? Or maybe for you guys, it's two days out. Same thing. So what's going on in this room? There's a detail gap. Details are missing in the information that we're trying to learn. And so I came up with this idea of a field of view. And this is what I say is the imagination field of view. And in this room, DJ, well, he's got another project that's closer to him. It's only a couple months away instead of a year. He's a road warrior, so he's trying to decide, is he going to lease his house or is he going to buy one? Like everybody else, he's got his eyes out for a new truck. And here's how you know I didn't get any help with this drawing, this terrible truck. He's got a child that's going to graduate high school. What's she going to want for graduation? Where is she going to go to college? And hmm, she wants it to go to the next step, get a ring, get a date. He's not sure. So he's got this romance thing going on in his head. And here's my question for you. What chance do I have a year before this project starts that that little level five or six piece of information with an asterisk by it, the DJ with 20 other people like him but with different specialties in the room, that he's going to think of that thing and tell me? It's almost zero. I need a way to have a time machine in that room, to pull that project in front of his mind, dominate his imagination, and now the only thing he can think about is telling me, hey, 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 that asterisk, I can't do this work the way you're planning it because this, and that happened. We needed an eight month runway to find a solution and test it. We did. We invested $150,000 and we saved four and a half million dollars. I'll make that deal all day, every day, but I need a time machine to find out about the opportunity early enough to act on it. There's one other line here. This is the cost. Early on, the cost of making mistakes with a time machine and virtual technology is very low. As you go on, that cost goes up and if you get the information too late, it can be catastrophic to the project. This is not an extremely complicated thing to do. You can do it with any project, with any challenge that you face. Transport people with good story. And if you have a chance, lean in with some technology, because technology that enables play and empathy creates a culture that is unstoppable. Six months after successfully completing that project, went to a dinner to celebrate it, saw DJ and actually hadn't seen him for almost a year because we didn't bump into each other during the project. He looked at me with what? You guessed it, a twinkle in his eye. A hug, a handshake. We did something awesome together because we were in a room and we were able to play. Now, today, we also need to talk about the importance of being able to play with ideas. There is an unfortunate hostility about ideas and dialogue. I grew up in Clemson. My dad taught political science. He had a friend, Dr. Slan, in his department, and they would walk two miles to work and two miles back, and they would debate ideas. They were ideologically pretty far apart. One would go to the Republican National Convention as a delegate. One was a member of the ACLU. <laughs> One was from Illinois, the land of Lincoln. One was from Israel. We would go to bar mitzvahs. They would come 
to our Christmas parties. And I watched my dad and Dr. Slan debate in their home, in our home, in their offices in Strode Tower. Ten years after both of them had left Clemson, gone on to other teaching locations, they came back together at my parents' home and happened to be in town for a visit. Dr. Slan, there over dinner, looked at me with a twinkle in his eye. He said, Charlie, as we have gotten older, I think your dad and I now know we have more in common than we usually used to think we did. What a powerful idea. Friendship does not depend on similarity. In fact, perhaps it's made stronger by differences. What's going on here? <laughs> this is Skip's farm. Let's go feed the bulls, they said. They're, <laughs> they're friendly, they said. Except this one. He decides to charge me. And I'm not a cowboy. I'm wearing sandals. I've never messed with bulls. There's seven adults, five kids in the bed of a pickup truck or in the pickup truck or a couple near the front of the truck where this picture is taken. And everyone, if you watch the video back, is yelling, Charlie, get in the truck, get in the truck. <laughs> of course, I'd rather be in the truck. Now, you may ask who's taking the video. Well, that's my wife. She, she wasn't any help with this bull situation. But she got the footage. As that bull lowered his head, came up at me, and I just instinctively grabbed his horn and pushed, I understood the meaning of take the bull by the horns. <laughs> Leverage is a thing. Archimedes, when he said, give me a place to stand and I shall move the world, he was on to something big. Play and empathy can change the human condition. Does anybody see anything you recognize? You can shout it out. Look at my feet. I had not done this for 22 years. Play works. I walked away. My legs were shaking, but I walked away. And then there's one other thing. Like I said, everybody but one person is yelling at me. Lucy, my eight-year-old daughter, the one that I tried to keep the twinkle in her eye. She's yelling, tui, 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 at the bull. That's her hand in the lower left corner of the picture. As I turn and pivot away, she throws that piece of bread in front of the bull's nose. Each of us have people that we love, we take care of, we teach, we lead. Please, don't yell the obvious. Work to keep the twinkle in her eye. It just may be the only thing someday between you and a charging bull. Play and empathy. You can do it. You can transport people with good story. Simply imagine that which is not and take other people there with you. I know we live in a challenging time, but I believe we're going to be okay if we simply work keep the twinkle in her eye.